Thank you so much, guys. All right. So I'm really excited for this, guys. Um, we have a really cool talk on the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so for anybody who's read the Bhagavad Gita before, could you just give me like a, a, a sentence or two synopsis of what you think this text is? Maybe just raise your hand. You can tell me a little bit about it. What is the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, is it just a bunch of stories about what the gods are up to? Like a bunch of like, why the mountain is this? Because Garuda was chasing this god and they did this thing. And then like later on, the same gods do different things and just kind of this. So not this one, actually. You, you might be thinking of the Vedas. The Vedas are these kinds of stories. Lots of different stories about different gods. The Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, maybe I'll hear from you over here. Yeah. yeah like the story of the world and like the, the, the conflict that is within Arjun as he tries to make a uh, big decision in his life of fighting a battle. Yes, awesome, thank you. What is your name? Jason. High five, Jason. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, so it is. So this uh, is a text about making a difficult decision. Hopefully, everybody was able to talk to Truett before uh, we started things off. Did any? Is there anybody who'd like to participate in the haiku or drawing contest that wasn't able to get uh, a piece of paper and some crayons? Anybody? Raise your hand. Going once, going twice, going three times. No. Okay, awesome. Um, in a little bit, we'll be collecting those. So, yeah, awesome. Cool, guys. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll let you know what we're going to be talking about tonight. So first, we're going to have a talk just on very general what the Bhagavad Gita is and the way that we can the way that we can read it, the different symbols that we should be looking out for, and the influence that it's had. Um, after this talk, we're going to have a small group discussion, and the question that we're going to be exploring there is: Is it wrong to kill? We'll have about fifteen minutes for this one. We'll see if we need to expand that a little bit further. We'll then head back to the Bhagavad Gita, and we'll have a talk on the conflicting demands of dharma. Dharma is kind of a, um, a cosmic rule set that a person is expected to follow in their life, and sometimes we feel drawn in many different directions, causing this kind of conflict. Um, and then also a talk on the death delusion. Um, so this is one of the solutions to this conflict that Arjun, the main character, is facing, um, is that you know life, death, they don't really exist. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit more what the Bhagavad Gita has to say there. After that, we'll have another small group discussion just questioning what death is and is death inherently and certainly and objectively a bad thing. We'll then head back for the final time to the Bhagavad Gita. We'll look at Krishna's advice to carry out life with what he calls unattached action, acting in a way where you're not attached to the outcome of the action. Um, and uh, his final advice that in every action we find devotion to Krishna in all things. Now, some of us, if we've had experience with, uh, maybe we were raised in the Christian church and we get a little irked out when we think about God, um, it's important to know here that the term Krishna and devotion to Krishna and the love of this God, it's not this God that's up there in the sky in some other place that we need to spend our life devoted to. It's literally right here. What's being talked about in the Bhagavad Gita is the culmination of every force, every person, every action, all together, lumped into one, personified in this kind of avatar called Krishna. We'll talk about all that a little bit more, I promise. Okay. Um, after that, we'll have our last small group discussion. Um, and the question there is, in the face of dilemma, this is actually very similar to your haikus, in the face of dilemma, how do you personally decide which choice to make? And when you're often given the advice, just follow your heart, what exactly does this mean? How do we follow our heart? How do we know that it's our heart talking as opposed to our mind or as opposed to uh, social programming or some external force? And uh, we're going to close up the night. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with the Hare Krishnas, uh, the people who go chanting around, singing, chanting, normally not wearing shoes, eating all vegan food. Um, so they, their sacred text is the Bhagavad Gita. They're are often seen kind of handing out the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a history on these guys. Very, very brief. Very, very brief. Um, and then I'd like to guide us through some of their chants. Um, and because they devote their whole life to this devotion of Krishna, maybe we can experience some of this firsthand for a little while. So that's everything we got. Does that sound good to everybody? Awesome. Cool. I'm really glad that you guys are all here. It's very exciting. With all of that said, I think that we can open up with a talk on the reader's lens. So this is the way that we can read the Bhagavad Gita. 
I'd like to start out with a quote. Um, and this is a quote that's often attributed to the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama. Um, whether or not the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama ever actually existed, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, but this is a quote that is attributed to him. Um, and he says, don't mistake the finger for the moon. And what he's saying here is that sometimes you might see a person who's pointing. Uh, if you saw my presentation at the open mic, you, you might have already heard all of this, I'm sorry. Um, but it's just an important lens through which to see all these things. So if a finger is pointing at the moon, oftentimes people will start staring at the finger and, and totally miss the moon. And what the Buddha here is saying is, don't look at the finger. Stop paying attention to the finger. Look at the thing the finger is pointing at. He's saying, don't take my word so literally. I am not God. I am not this big expanse, this transcendent thing. Don't look at me. Don't look at my words. Instead, look at what my words are indirectly pointing to. And this is a way that we can also begin to analyze the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I'd really suggest not looking at this as a historical text, not looking at this in a fundamental way, taking all of these things as... Um, uh, not just as gospel, but taking all of these things as scientific truths, but instead looking at it all through a real metaphorical lens, understanding what's being said uh, kind of indirectly through this text. Um, as we read, as we explore this text, we'll find a few symbols that uh, thr throughout the book, and there are way more symbols than just these three, but these three are perhaps the most important to recognize. The first one, the field of battle. So this entire text is a story, it's a narrative, that t it's a conversation that takes place on a battlefield. And this battlefield is not just a field of physical battle taking place here on Earth, but this is a representation, it's a metaphor, for a war that's taking place in each one of our minds, in each one of our hearts, for a, a, a war that's taking place maybe in the cosmic realm or the transcendent realm, some other realm that we just can't tap into here. We're trying to talk about something that we just can't use words to directly or explicitly talk about. We're using these metaphors to indirectly get there. The main character of this story, um, a person called Arjun, who's a warrior, uh, born into the warrior class, um, it's important that we not just look at Arjun as a combat warrior, but also a kind of spiritual warrior, someone who is ready to face the challenges of this spiritual conquest, understanding his spiritual self, uh, understanding the transcendent. And the other main character in this story is Arjun's chariot guide uh, by the name of Krishna. Now, uh, Krishna is not just a chariot guide, of course, but actually serves the role as a kind of spiritual guide in this context. Um, and uh, as a chariot guide, um, it's important to remember that we're not just looking at the sites that all at each one of these different destinations, not these stops along the way. And it's also not the individual teachings, but it has much more to do with the process. Um, he's not a teacher, let's say, but a guide. He's not telling Arjun the whole time what the answer is, but he's taking him on a journey so that Arjun can come up with the answers, come up with the teachings on his own, like any good teacher, yeah? Does that all make sense? Cool, any questions about these? these symbols, I think that they'll make more sense as we continue, as we move along, and you understand a little bit more about the story, but maybe just keep these in the background of your mind. Does anyone know this guy? Yeah, this is Jordan Peterson. Raise your hand if you love Jordan Peterson. Raise your hand if you hate Jordan Peterson. Okay, yeah. So... <laughs> Most people lie on, on, on one of those camps. He's a, pretty, he's a pretty divisive figure. So Jordan Peterson, he's a clinical psychologist from the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, I was introduced to him through uh, a lecture series. It was called the, uh, it was a lecture series on the psychological significance of the biblical stories. Now, whether it's the biblical stories or the Hindu stories or the uh, Muslim stories doesn't really matter. Um, what he's talking about is really um, metaphorical ways to understand spiritual stories and what they have to say about our own psychology. Um, so the, the line that I think is applicable here from Jordan Peterson, he says, the people who are adamant anti-religious thinkers seem to believe that if we abandon our immersement in the underlying dream, that we'd all instantly become rationalists like Descartes or Bacon. And I don't believe that for a moment because I don't think there's any evidence for it. I think that we become so irrational, so rapidly, 
that the weirdest mysteries of Catholicism would seem positively rational by contrast. Yeah. He says, these are the stories that have been holding together our psyches, holding together our cultures for thousands of years. And if we just abandon them, if we just get rid of them, um, well, maybe the consequences of that are something that we're actually seeing right now in the turmoil that we're seeing right now in the world today. Um, he's asked sometimes, do you believe in God? And his response to this is often something like, well, you know, I, I don't think that it's a fair question. Because one, what you mean by God is certainly not the same as what I mean by God. And what you mean by belief is certainly not the same as what I mean by belief. So the first question I'd like to ask here is, what does it mean to believe in something? Uh, I think that we all believe, let's say, in the number five, but is the number five actually real? Is it real in the way that I'm real, or real in the way that this table is real? Um, we all maybe live our life as though the future is real. Uh, we believe that the future will come here. Is, th is the future real? Does the future actually exist? Um, so I'll open this one up to the floor. What does the word believe mean? Yeah, true it. To believe in something doesn't necessarily mean it, it's real. Like you can believe that uh, Harry Potter's best friend is Ron Weasley, but all of that is just not real, but you believe it. I've always defined belief as if you believe something is going to happen, you're not surprised when it does. So if, you, if something happens and you're not surprised, then you believed it. Yeah, thank you, True. Anything else from anybody? Great. Yeah, I see two hands back here, and maybe we'll we'll cap it at that. Yeah, please. Um, I guess what well, I think it well, what belief means is essentially what you think or feel to be true. In a sense, it's what you yeah believe to be true. So right. Yeah, so Truett, uh, pardon the pun, actually brought up a, a, a good point there um, about like Ron Weasley or say, um, say, uh, yeah, if you were to ask uh, what color hair does Ron Weasley have, all of us might be able to say red, but Ron Weasley doesn't actually exist. He's not actually real, and yet we can still hold beliefs about him. Oh, no. <coughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So I think what it means to believe in something or like what belief really is, is it's the groundwork and the foundation of the world that you live in. Um, with the example of the number five, well, the number five isn't really real. It's an idea, but we've all agreed on this idea that if I give you five crayons and you say you want five crayons, we can determine the exact number of crayons that you actually want to have. Um, and then... But that also shapes our framework for what we believe is possible, what roles we think we should have, and like our lives. So and I'll give it back now. All right, cool. Yeah, thank you so much for those guys. Um, so uh, normally what happens when we ask these big group discussion questions, um, there might be silence for a while, and then that one person ends up speaking, and then we have like a waterfall of 100 people. So please be that one person to start speaking. Thank you, True, for starting that one. If you felt like you didn't get your chance, we will have a small group discussion in, in just a little while that'll last quite a while, um, then I'm sure that you will let your voice be heard. Um, but for right now, we're going to move on. Um, so I'd like to talk a little about the history um, of the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, the Bhagavad Gita is um, the scriptural text of which religion? Which religion? Yeah, Hinduism. Hinduism. Now, uh, it's important to say that Hinduism uh, is actually a term that was invented by colonists, uh, by colonists and merchants around the 18th century. Um, so in India, there were loads of different religions. Um, and the term Hindu started being used sometime around the 5th century BCE, um, but it was actually referring to uh, geography. So it was people who lived next to the Indus River were called Hindus. It was only once there were colonists and merchants from the West uh, who started to trade with the Indians, that they started to refer to their collective religions as Hinduism. Um, but no one in India would really call themselves, at least at that time, a Hindu. There were people who believed specifically in, in Lord Vishnu, people who prayed specifically towards this god or that god, or were maybe a yogi or maybe a Buddhist. Um, and we kind of collected all of these into one big pot called Hinduism, uh, basically a term invented by Westerners. Now, um, 
So there are many different belief structures, many different ideas out there. Um, and it's said that the Bhagavad Gita seems to be a synthesis of all of these different Indian belief structures. Um, so Gerald James Larson, who's an Indologist and scholar of classical Indian philosophy, he said, if there is any one text that comes near to embodying the totality of what it is to be a Hindu, it would be the Bhagavad Gita. So this is um, you know, many different religions, but all sharing a relatively similar baseline, relatively similar underlying belief structure. Okay, so let's talk about it. What is the Bhagavad Gita? Um, so it's debated when the Bhagavad Gita was written, but we believe it was written sometime between the 5th and 2nd centuries BCE. Like any of these ancient texts, we just don't know exactly when it was written. Um, of course, it is the most famous Hindu text, not the only one. There are certainly Hindus that don't read the Bhagavad Gita, but it's certainly the most famous. Um, and it has the most number of translations of any text in the world, um, only second to to the Bible. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita translates from Sanskrit to the Song of God. Gita meaning song, Bhagavad being defined in many different ways. Uh, the Song of God, the Song of the Divine, the Song of the Lord, the Celestial Song. So if you see any books with all of these differing titles, um, they're all referring to the same text. It's also called sometimes the Isvara Gita. So in yogic traditions, their name for God is Isvara. Uh, it's composed of 18 different chapters and 700 verses. Um, th it used to be kind of uh, maybe much, th there used to be more verses, less verses. Um, it was around the 8th century with a guy called Adi Shankara that uh, it was kind of set in stone to be 700 verses. Each one of these chapters is considered its own teaching, its own lesson. Um, and we'll be exploring four of these lessons in here today. I'd love to be able to spend, uh, you know, uh, a year, a year unpacking this whole text with you guys. Unfortunately, we're, uh, we're just down to about two hours. So this is a fraise from the early 8th century depicting the Mahabharata, which is the, um, the greater text that surrounds the Bhagavad Gita. This is a depiction of Krishna from the 12th century. Another at the temple of Chengu Narayan in Nepal. And this depiction comes from the 17th century. Um, Krishna is often depicted, uh, as per the Bhagavad Gita, as having um, many, many heads, you know, a thousand different heads, um, just overwhelming in his force and might. Um, this kind of depiction just showing his, his sheer strength and it being so much larger and grander than what our minds can really hold on to. Um, this is a depiction from 1740. Again, with all of these many heads, there's one moment in the text when Krishna reveals himself, reveals his true nature to Arjun. Uh, Arjun is the warrior, Krishna the chariot driver. Krishna reveals his true nature, and it's at this moment that he has this bright light shining brighter than a thousand suns, revealing many different faces. That's just too much. Uh, Arjun felt as though he was going to be blinded by seeing the true face of Krishna. So instead, he asked Krishna to go back to his original human-like persona form so that Arjun could look at him again. This is an 18th century script of the Bhagavad Gita. 19th century Sanskrit. Early 1900s. Another depiction of Krishna here. And from 2018, our own Laura Hardy Stewart made this. So uh, this is Krishna in his human-like form. Laura, back here. Thank you very much for this one, Laura. Thank you. Um, she's been making this artwork for us for maybe about the last eight, eight or nine weeks. Doing an incredible job. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, and in just a little while, we'll, we'll get a chance to look at all of your all of your drawings and all of your haikus, which I'm really excited for. Okay. All right. So, um, like I mentioned shortly, uh, briefly, the Bhagavad Gita is one book with within a much larger text called the Mahabharata. Um, and the Mahabharata is a Hindu 
epic poem. It's sometimes referred to as the fifth Veda. Uh, the Veda's very ancient stories being written um, f from about the fifth century BC all the way up until around the, the 1500s. So it's this massive work that's been collected over about 2,000 years, uh, and this is referred to as the fifth Veda. Um, the Mahabharata is the largest poem ever written, the longest poem ever written. And I'll just say it one more time, the Bhagavad Gita is encased within the Mahabharata. Um, it has 100,000 verses, the Mahabharata, and that's 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. So it's this massive text. And it's a song, and there are people who memorize this entire text from start to finish, this massive work memorized. So the Mahabharata is the story of the Kuruksetra War, uh, and this is a war of succession between two branches of a clan, so it's the same family, so two sides of the same family fighting against one another. And these are the Kaurava and the Pandava. There's going to be a quiz on all of this, so I hope that you guys are writing this down. Um, now, it's debated whether or not this war ever actually happened, right? But it doesn't really matter. The, the, the historical accuracy of this is not really the point here. But there are many people who, who do believe that this is um, historical fact. Now, it's debated whether or not the Bhagavad Gita started as an independent text. Um, it's written in a very different style than the rest of the Mahabharata. The belief is that the Mahabharata was such a famous war epic. You know, it was like, a, it was, I, I don't know, what's, what's a famous action movie? Top Gun? Uh, Saving Private Ryan. It's like some really famous action movie, and then they're like, okay, people love this. We're going to inject some real philosophy into the middle of this text so that people actually get it. You know, A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So they injected the Bhagavad Gita into the middle of the Mahabharata. The whole Bhagavad Gita, not the whole Mahabharata, the whole Bhagavad Gita, the text that we're exploring here tonight, is a dialogue between Arjun, who's the prince of the Pandavas, the prince the, of one of these uh, two warring sides of the family, these two clans, or these two sides of the clan. Um, and the second character is his guide uh, and his charioteer, who's Krishna. Um, and it's revealed that Krishna is actually an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Vishnu uh, is believed to be the god from whom all other gods spring. So he is the supreme lord. Nothing is above uh, Lord Vishnu. If, if many of us come from Christian backgrounds or Jewish backgrounds, when we use the word God, we think of the Alpha and the Omega. Nothing is larger than this one God. Um, in Hinduism, it's quite different, where many of the gods, almost like Greek gods or Roman gods, they have flaws, and they aren't all powerful. They can't do everything. Um, and that's the case for Hindu gods, um, except for Vishnu. Vishnu is the culmination of every god, the culmination of every thought, every action, ever. Okay. And that's his chariot driver, which is fun. <laughs> okay. Now, it's, um, we don't really know who wrote this. There's a nice story that is within the Mahabharata um, that says that it was written by a sage Vyasa, um, Vyasa is also credited with writing much of the Vedas and some other famous texts. Um, so the idea is that, or the story goes, that Vyasa narrated this text to Ganesha. Um, probably you've seen this uh, this uh, Hindu god who has the face of an elephant with one of his tusks missing. Have you guys all seen that? Yeah, okay. So the story is that he narrated all of this to Ganesha. And uh, Ganesha is writing using this feather, and then the feather breaks. So uh, Ganesha cares so much about the text that's being written that he breaks off his own tusk and then begins using that as a writing instrument. And this is the reason why Ganesha is often depicted as only having one tusk. He tore it off to write the Bhagavad Gita. So here's Ganesha. You're probably familiar without one tusk here. Um, and if anyone here has been to Angkor Wat, this is a, a carving from Angkor Wat um, sometime around the 12th century. Um, here you can see Vyasa uh, narrating this story here to Ganesha. A very different depiction than what we're used to today. Um, yeah. 
Okay. So, again, Vyasa has actually been credited with loads of other texts, so we don't really think that he was a real person. Um, he's also just this kind of symbol, somebody that, uh, that writes, that's been accredited with many different texts. Um, there are lots of different writing styles, even throughout the Bhagavad Gita, so we assume that there are maybe many people that wrote the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about the, the narrative. Go down through the narrative. What happens in this story? Um, and I'd like to start with a question for you guys. Um, how close have you all come uh, to killing one of your relatives? Anybody in the room ever kill a relative before? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean like, how close thinking about it or like how close? Well, I imagine that a lot of us have thought about it before. <laughs> I imagine, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, okay, so, um, but this, this is the dilemma that's facing Arjun, who's the main character in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so again, Arjun, he's the prince of the Pandavas, he's the greatest warrior, and his chariot driver, Krishna, this one's Krishna here, Here's Arjun. Uh, his chariot driver, Krishna, uh, an incarnation of the Supreme Lord, Vishnu. So as the story goes, we begin on the brink of the final battle of this war, the Kurukshetra War. Arjuna uh, asks his chariot driver, Krishna, to drive to the center of the battlefield so that he can see those, quote, who are so eager for war. He wanted to see their faces. He didn't understand why people loved killing so much. When he looked at his enemies, when he looked at the other half of this clan, he saw his own family members, he saw his own friends, he saw teachers that he's had in his past. And he's immediately struck with this dilemma. So he doesn't want to fight these people because they're his loved ones, they're his family. He feels inside of himself that he shouldn't kill his own family members, he needs to be devout to his family. Um, but also he recognizes that he's a warrior and he has a responsibility to fight. So he's struck with this intense dilemma. He drops his bow and he considers to renounce his entire life, to become a renunciant, to just live out in the forest somewhere. He then asks Krishna for some counsel. So Krishna is his chariot driver. He's been giving him advice this whole time. He asks for some, for some advice on the morality of war and what he should do. Should he fight uh, or should he not kill his family members and his teachers? It's at this moment when his chariot driver reveals himself to be an incarnation of the Lord Vishnu. This is in the very, very, very beginning of the whole story, okay? Um, and, uh, and Vishnu, again, is the source of all other gods, of all other incarnations of God. Uh, what follows over the next 18 chapters are uh, questions and answers. So Arjuna asks a question to Krishna about the morality of killing, and then Krishna answers. Question, answer, question, answer, ping-ponging back and forth. Um, Krishna never really giving a firm answer, but actually guiding Arjuna towards some kind of answer the whole time. Now, this text has been extremely influential to people all over the world. Um, Mahatma Gandhi once said, when disappointment stares me in the face and all alone I see not one ray of light, I go back to the Bhagavad Gita. I find a verse here and a verse there and I immediately begin to smile. So, of course, Mahatma Gandhi, well known for his um, peaceful protesting against colonization of India, um, finding much of his influence from the Bhagavad Gita. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah, Henry David Thoreau, that's right. And what was Henry David Thoreau's most famous text? Walden, yeah. So this story of him building a house out next to a pond, out next to a lake. Um, so when he went to Walden, um, he brought with him very, very, very few items. The Bhagavad Gita was one of these items that he brought out there with him. Um, so if you're a Thoreau fan. Um, and also, so what we're looking at here is the Trinity test of the Manhattan Project. So when the United States was developing the atom bomb, when they first tested the atom bomb, this is not Hiroshima or Nagasaki, this is just the test, but when they first saw this immense cloud and this immense um, ball of fire shoot into the sky, the director of the Manhattan Project, Robert Oppenmeyer, Oppenheimer, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita and he said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
So now we can move into our first small group discussion, really setting the playing field here. We'll see what Arjuna's questions are. We'll see what Krishna's answers are. But first, I think it's important that we take some time to explore this for ourselves. So the first question that I have for you guys is, is it wrong to kill? Is it wrong to kill? Is it wrong to kill? Um, so for anybody who's new, a, s a good small group size is somewhere between, say, four and about six people. If you get larger than that, it's really hard to let everybody's voices be heard, and that's a really important part of all of this. So, um, yeah, if we can break up four to six people, we'll take about ten minutes for this one, then we'll come on back. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> well... So this do doesn't actually matter. D uh, you ki ki killing anything, yeah. You can talk about all of those. Killing plants, killing animals, killing humans, whatever you want uh, to discuss. Go for it, guys. Thank you very much.